Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning. Good morning. Go ahead and put in the chat um, where you're from, your name and where you're from, so we can give our wonderful speaker an idea of, of some of the cities that you guys are representing. Okay, thank you, Juan. I'm so glad that you said good morning because I was starting to get nervous that nobody could hear us and I hit the wrong button. So welcome. We've got Florida. Harris County. Yes. Little Rock. Awesome. Oh, wow. nice. Omaha, Garland, Allen. Welcome, guys. We're so excited you're here. We're going to officially start in about um, one more minute. We'll officially start just to give everyone some time to get in and look through the chat, get familiar with the workshop and everything. And um, Christina, I did go and look at the live preview and you look great. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> Just wanted to. I'm I'm short, so uh, I just wanted to make wow. sure that you know I people can actually see my face. I know I, I gonna, look really tall virtually. I look really tall. Uh, virtually. <laughs> I, I was gonna have to go back uh, and see if I can find a, some books or something to sit on if I'm too short. No, you're good. You're good. Hi, Barbara from Birmingham. I got to go to Birmingham for Nusa a few years ago. It was so much fun. Okay, Miss Christina, are you ready to get started? I am. Perfect. So welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us um, for this wonderful workshop, partnering with, with municipal or local government for neighborhood equity. I don't know about you guys, but I am super pumped that I get to be the host and, and get to be here for this, this workshop. It's something I am so passionate about, and so I can't wait to hear from, from our speaker today. My name's Tabitha Butler. For those of you who haven't met me yet, I work for the city of Fort Worth in the communications and public engagement department. Um, and I have been on the planning committee for NUSA and it has been so much fun for the last year and a half getting ready for this. So before we start, I just wanna remind you of some of the features that you have here in an event. At the top right hand side of your screen, you've got an inbox button. You can chat with anybody in the conference there. So if later you need to send me a message, um, you can send it there. If you have a question, um, go feel free to put it there. But if you see, you know, somebody in the chat that you're like, man, I really want to connect with them. That's how you can connect with them later. Um, you can use the chat function to um, chat with each other, chat with us. Um, if you're having a technical difficulty or have a question, I'll try to address it during the presentation. On the right-hand side, you also have, it's a little person like in front of a chalkboard, like a, like a teacher. That's where you can ask your questions. So I'm just gonna ask that you put your questions there and um, Christina will answer them as she is able. And then I don't think we're doing any polls, so there, but there's a poll button there. And then all the people that are there, so you can see everybody that's in the conference with you. And then there is um, a flyer, a, a, a file under the little three papers that are all stacked up together. And I will let Christina tell us about that um, during her presentation or after. And so after going through all of those things, I hope that you use those tools to stay connected since we can't be together per, in person. I did want to tell you about a feature that I learned earlier. Um, if you want to make your screen bigger, go all the way down to the bottom of the screen um, where we are and click. There's like a little box that's kind of open and that will make your screen full screen. So we can't see that on our end, but you guys can see that and make your screen bigger. Um, I've had a lot of questions about that come up today. So we are so excited to introduce our wonderful speaker. Um, this is Ms. Christina Brooks, and she is the City of Fort Worth Chief Equity Officer and Director of the Diversity and Inclusion Department. And we are very proud to have her here today. 
So without further ado, I will turn it over to her. Thank you so much, Tabitha. And good morning, good morning to everyone from all over the country. I see Oregon and Alabama and Florida, and of course our own uh, Texas is represented um, in the room today, in the virtual room today. So I'm happy uh, to talk to you this morning about partnering with local government for neighborhood equity. Um, and we're gonna jump right into the presentation. As we go through the presentation, there'll be um, some uh, uh, slides where I will ask for um, you to respond or give me some feedback and you can drop, drop those uh, comments or uh, answers to some of the questions that I'll have. This is kind of the only way that we can be um, interactive in a virtual environment. So um, just drop your answers in, uh, in the chat uh, and I'll be able to read some of those off as we move through um, the material today. So um, let's get started. All right, so the agenda for today's session, um, we're gonna start out talking about the why. Why is this even a topic? Um, that we need to think about. Then we're going to go through some um, foundational definitions that are really important to having a constructive conversation um, in this space. We're going to talk about who our stakeholders are in this conversation, the drivers for the work that we do, ways of accountability, and then some takeaways, and then we'll have time at the end for some Q&A. Sound good to everybody? Give me a thumbs up in a virtual or uh, yeah, that sounds good or uh, no, this <laughs> sounds like too much already uh, first thing in the morning. So I, I have my coffee here. I hope everybody else has their cup of coffee. I'm going to be drinking it um, throughout the presentation. So let's let's get started. Um, so why are inclusive, diverse equitable and accessible neighborhoods important? Why are they important? Want to hear your feedback in the chat. What makes them, these particular types of neighborhoods important? Inclusive, diverse, equitable, and accessible. Why should we have those? All right. I'm Seeing uh, some thumbs up there. Any ideas on why it's important to have inclusive, diverse, equitable, and accessible neighborhoods or idea neighborhoods? You got to talk back. <laughs> I need your feedback. Okay, uh, some of the comments, first comments, they're interesting and not cookie cutter. That's great. Uh, they represent our city stability. Those are all good answers anymore. Because we all matter, absolutely. Creates opportunities for all, absolutely. Including all persons, everyone has their strengths. Absolutely, these are all really great answers, right? Um, it's healthy. <laughs> All is the operative word. These are really good, uh, really good ideas on why it's so important for us to really consider um, the importance of having inclusive and diverse and equitable and accessible neighborhoods. Um, you know, uh, there's also a lot of conversation around um, wealth generation when you talk about home ownership and safety uh, issues um, when you talk about neighborhoods, making sure that everybody has the opportunity to live in a really great, safe neighborhood that has access um, to all the wonderful things that um, uh, typically homeowners look for, good schools, um, great neighbors, um, the aesthetic or the, the, the culture of a neighborhood can be unique. Um, and I think one of you already mentioned that. So these are all really important ways that uh, are reasons behind why we want to make sure that our neighborhoods are equitable and um, accessible. 
And so before we start in on this conversation, because we're going to dive a little deep if you're if you're OK with that this morning, um, we have to have some foundational definitions for the words that we may use today when we talk about uh, equity or inclusion, um, when we talk about bringing that to your neighborhood and working hand in hand with your local government. And so we're going to define race ethnicity, and culture. Now, a lot of times people will use these words interchangeably and they're not really interchangeable terms because they have very different meanings. And so we'll talk a little bit about that and we'll get the definitions uh, that we're gonna use for our conversations today and as context for what we mean when we say race in the context of uh, working with neighborhoods and local government, what we mean when we say ethnicity and what we mean by culture. And so um, here are some working definitions. Race is actually a pretty contemporary uh, term and it is a social construct. It's based in economic uh, expedience and power and it has nothing to do with biology, right? but it does group human beings on shared phenotypes or, or physical likeness or uh, features. And they usually are grouped together based on skin color or hair texture and, um, and, and a few other things uh, that can be involved when you put uh, a person or an individual in a racialized category. So when you talk about black or white or Asian or uh, Hispanic, it doesn't have anything to do with biology or DNA. It's a social construct that's really based on what you look like. Now, ethnicity is different because it is um, kind of based in biology. And so it traces back a, a DNA connection to a human population group that originates from a particular geographic location or global region. That's ethnicity. Culture is something different altogether, right? It's just a set of behaviors and beliefs and characteristics of a particular social or ethnic or age group. And it's the way that they live, right? It's the way that they choose to be in the world. And they uh, are those ideas of being or behaviors and beliefs are transmitted from one generation to another. And so um, it can be, uh, culture can be something that was established for adaptation or survival. And it's distinguished um, sometimes by an unspoken set of rules uh, and values, what, what people eat, how they behave, how they respond in certain situations, um, and then how they communicate. So those are the three distinct definitions or what race is, it's social construct, has nothing to do with biology. It's really just based on what people look like and how they're grouped uh, based on what they look like, phenotypes. Ethnicity is a biological or DNA connection to a human population. And then culture is just kind of a set of beliefs and ways of being uh, that, are, that have generally um, emanated uh, because people had to adapt or a people had to adapt for survival. And it involves uh, all of these things like habits and foods and language patterns, ways of thinking and communicating in different ways. So does everybody um, kind of get what those three distinct differences are? They're not the same thing. So now, from now on, whenever you hear people kind of try to use these words or terms interchangeably, you can now tell them ah, race is not the same thing as ethnicity and uh, race and ethnicity is not the same thing as culture. They're all very different. All right, so using those three definitions, now let's get to what, what exactly does equity mean? And um, there are a lot of ways that equity is defined and this is something you know, in your own communities, it's important for you to have a clear and shared and common 
definition for what equity means in your community. Uh, because everybody can kind of uh, pick and choose what that looks like in their community. So you you need to make sure that you um, have a shared definition for this. So I'm going to share with you what Fort Worth's definition uh, is um, uh, when it comes to equity. So for us in Fort Worth, it means the process of incorporating racial, ethnic, cultural, and other identity group history in ensuring frameworks, laws, and policies, and practices, processes, services, activities are intentionally designed with accountability measures that produced fair, impartial, and just access and outcomes for all identity groups and communities. These processes can and should be measured for improvement and progress, especially pertaining to civil and human rights and protections under the law. Um, because we want to ultimately, at the end of the day, we want to make sure that we're creating conditions for all to prosper while acknowledging and accepting differences without requiring any identity group to assimilate. Uh, so you shouldn't have to be become something else other than what you are in order for you to thrive in any community. So that's what we mean in Fort Worth when we talk about equity. Now, there are some different um, kind of underlying types of equity. So if we could look at equity kind of as this umbrella, there are subcategories of equity um, that I also want to share with you um, before we kind of get into a more um, robust conversation about what this means when we're talking about neighborhood equity and partnering with local government. So you'll see on the screen there are five types of uh, equity at work. So there's procedural equity, and that just means that an inclusive or accessible, authentic engagement, uh, representation in the process to develop or implement. So that's procedural equity, making sure that when you're talking about programs that you may have at your local park um, or programs that you may have at your community center, is there procedural equity involved there? Are you looking at ways that, that ensure everybody can participate in those programs? Then there's uh, distributional equity, which means looking at programs and policies um, that result in fair distribution of benefits and burdens across all segments of a community and prioritizing those with the highest need. So when you're talking about distributional equity, um, it's kind of making sure that everybody is, is carrying their own weight, right? They're, they're pulling, uh, they have some skin in the game and that everybody is both contributing and benefiting at an equitable rate. And we're looking at those that have the highest need and prioritizing them. Next, we have structural equity. And when we talk about structural equity, this means that decision makers institutionalize accountability um, so that when you start to think about how you can make things uh, fair in programming or activities or laws, um, that there's accountability attached to that. And in that accountability, the decisions are made with recognition of historical, cultural, and institutional dynamics and structures that have routinely advantaged or privileged um, groups in society and resulted in chronic or cumulative disadvantage uh, for uh, subordinated groups. So making sure that you're taking into, uh, into, into um, the thought process, um, the history, like what has happened before when we've done things a certain way who's really benefited and who hasn't, and looking at that as structural equity. Then we have transgenerational equity. Um, and this just means that decisions are made where you consider different generational impacts. Um, and you don't want, you want to make sure that there's no kind of unfair burden on, on one particular generation than on another, for another. Um, specifically, you don't want to kind of create all of these uh, policies or programs 
that are great for your current generation, but are really going to make it difficult for any future generations coming along. So you want to make sure that you're taking that into account. And then finally, transformational equity. And this means that there's a distinct notion that communities um, have indigenous capacity to govern and sustain themselves and their communities, um, that they have voice and influence and agency um, in regional, state, or national affairs. So this really comes from um, the idea that uh, there, are, you know, you always have to have an uh, an outsider to come in and fix what's going on in your community, um, rather than um, supporting kind of homegrown uh, ideas and homegrown leadership, making sure that you have a good mix of both, because you do want to introduce new ideas, but you don't want to do that at the exclusion of the voices that may already be available in your community. Everybody needs to work together for the best outcomes in your neighborhoods. And so we couldn't have this discussion without talking about power and what that means. Um, when you talk about relationships, there's always uh, a power dynamic at work, whether you uh, acknowledge it or realize it or not, but there's always this idea of power. And so for our working definition of power, it means the possession or control or command over others an authority or ascendancy, a legal ability, capacity, uh, or delegated authority, right? Power also um, can be understood as the ability to influence other or impose one's beliefs. And all power, like I said, is relational. And the different relationships either reinforce or dis disrupt one another. And so um, true power requires three key activities. You have the ability to design rules. You have the ability to decide who wins. And you have the ability to tell the story, right? You get to construct the story around uh, the design of the rules and who wins. Those three things are usually at work whenever you talk about power. And so in the, uh, in the sense that we're talking about a relationship between government and community, um, designing the rules is usually legislation and ordinances or policies within um, uh, your city government. And then deciding who wins is largely de determined by the policy and the process, how the process is set up. Does it, is it set up? so that um, uh, one group or individuals um, really has the advantage um, over another group? Or does it, is it equitable? And everybody kind of has a fair shot. And you're not gonna know that until you actually do some really intense research and understand impact as opposed to intent, right? There are lots of well-meaning policies out there. Um, and nobody intended for the policy to actually um, uh, injure or be a barrier to anybody. But once it's actually in place, when you start to track the data, you, you may start to notice that, mm, wait a minute, not everybody is getting the most out of this. And so um, uh, then you have, uh, you know, telling the story and that's communication, right? We have, uh, you know, I would say 15, 20 years ago, uh, there were really very specific channels where you could communicate um, what you wanted to say and what you wanted said. And so with the, um, in the age of social media, that has kind of broken wide open. So people can kind of tell their own story on social media platforms, and you don't necessarily need to wait for uh, to watch it at the on the six o'clock news or read it in the newspaper, people uh, and communities generate their own story, and so all of all three of these things uh, are a part of uh, the conversation around power. And so, power is not only an individual relationship, but an institutional and systemic one. Um, power relationships are shifting constantly, so you'll see things moving back and forth. 
uh, between who holds the power, who designs the rules, who um, deciding who wins with the policy and then telling the story is really kind of that moving target all the time um, because people have the ability to, to tell their own story and define the situations for themselves. And so um, individuals within an institution or system may benefit from power of which they are not aware. So you don't always have to be like uh, in the know that you're wielding um, this power, uh, but it doesn't change the fact that you have that power. Um, and based on those three things, the design of the rule, deciding who wins and telling the story, that can shift. So it doesn't depend on whether or not you know that you have the power, it just depends. Uh, it's really more about impact um, and influence. And so um, next, let's kind of dive into um, the next aspect of our conversation, knowing yourself and knowing your stakeholders. So for our conversation today, um, we're going to talk about uh, this in the context of uh, ask or, or three specific um, areas. So awareness skills, and knowledge. Anytime you talk about equity or an inclusion, um, it really should start with these three concepts, being aware, having a specific set of skills, and having a specific knowledge or, or being inquisitive to understand uh, kind of historical implications. And so what we when we talk about ask, um, it's important for us to kind of understand us, right? Understanding our own individual identity and what kind of makes up our individual identity. And so when we do that, we look at all of the different layers or dimensions of individual identity. And at the core, right there in the center, that little yellow dot right in the middle, middle you'll see that there is individual personality, right? That's who, that's kind of, you know, when if you take a personality test, if anybody is, is familiar with MBTI or uh, DISC assessments or any of those types of uh, personality tests, that's who you are kind of at your core. Like if you are a type A personality or if you're an INTJ, according to the MBTI scale, that's kind of who you are. And it really determines how you prefer to communicate and how you prefer for people to communicate with you. So that's at the core, your individual personality. Then you get into your individual identity. And these are typically things that people may um, assume they can ascertain about you just by looking at you. We, we know that that's not, <laughs> that is not a, the best way to, to go about uh, trying to understand people, but with individual identity, it's looking at things like your, your race, your ethnicity, your age, your ability, uh, your gender. Um, those would be identified as your individual identity. And then in the next layer of individual identity, it comes to um, external identity. And these are things that typically you, you can't necessarily uh, see just by looking at people, <clears throat> but they're an important part of who we are. So it can uh, be anything from uh, your marital status, your parental status. Do you have kids? Um, your geographic location, your educational attainment level. These would all be considered external identity. And then in the next layer, we have organizational identity. And this deals with kind of uh, who you are in the workplace, right? It, it can cover everything from uh, your classification at work or seniority um, or any anything along those lines um, would be characterized as your organizational identity. All the way down to things like where you actually work, um, the location of your office in an organization. You know, are you on the top floor of the building? Or do you work in the basement? Or do you, you know, are you in uh, a part of the uh, organization in a building in the organization that people easily recognize? 
Um, and then finally, you have your community identity. And this one's pretty uh, important because um, community identity is really centered around access and proximity to things. So this is really, really where kind of the neighborhood uh, and where you live as a part of your identity comes into play, right? Um, you're looking at access to clean water and technology and quality schools and um, your relationship with uh, public safety, um, transportation, housing, all of those things are a part of who you are. And so when you think about all of these dimensions of us as individuals, we don't see things in the world as they are. We see things as we are. We see them through this lens that develops over time through all of our layers of identity that were impacted and shaped and formed by our experiences, our own uh, exposure, and our own socialization, how we grew up. What do you think about that? Do you agree or do you disagree? Do you think, Christina, uh, that's a bunch of poppycock. I, there's no way that any of this stuff affects who I am as an individual. I determine that it doesn't have anything to do with, you know, where I live or my educational attainment or, uh, you know, if I speak two languages or three, none of that matters. What do you think? Give me some feedback. Okay, I, I see a couple of people saying they agree. All right. Let's see. Need a couple more people to respond. Absolutely. Juan says absolutely agrees. Barbara said she agrees. All right. So it uh, looks like... Um, all right, Chris says all those factors definitely affect how uh, how you see the world. Um, David is saying very interesting. Yeah, um, this is some pretty pretty cool stuff. Um, so yeah, all of those things really play a part in being self aware, knowing yourself first. So if you can begin to understand how you are and how you see the world, then you might begin to understand that hmm. My way of looking at things and my way of seeing the world is completely unique, right? There are people that may grow up in the same house with you, go to the same schools as you did, but have completely different outlooks on life. And that is because there is all of this infinite number of combinations where our different layers of identity combined with our exposure and our own individual experiences um, make things uh, very different. Even though we may have some things that are shared, there is a lot that is completely unique to us. So when we start to look at uh, the world and we understand that, hmm, my way of thinking about things could be completely unique to me and not everybody uh, could or should share that perspective. Um, and so you need to think about that when you go into having conversations with um, other individuals. So now let's talk about the stakeholders. When we get into this conversation of how can we work um, together with uh, our local government in making our neighborhoods more equitable, we have to think about this idea of who the stakeholders are and the different types of identity groups um, back on that identity wheel um, we're talking about when we think about community. Who is community? Who is a part of our community? So we think about in, in any neighborhood, you're thinking about uh, you know home builders and musicians and uh, the elderly and environmentalists and artists and restaurants and medical or healthcare facilities and educational institutions, childcare, uh, grocery stores, 
all of these organizations and then all of the different layers of identity, individual identity, the individuals all kind of make up what we would consider community stakeholders. So making sure that they are all represented in the conversations is key to, to centering equity. Then on the other side, when you look at local government and you start to think about, okay, how, how does my local government really impact um, my neighborhood? And for most localities, you're talking about transportation, you're talking about uh, the criminal justice system, you're talking about uh, economic development, you're talking about um, uh, law enforcement, aviation, parks, the fire department, the police department, um, who picks up your trash, right? All the way down to IT and broadband access or internet access that's within the neighborhoods. So having all of the local government stakeholders and all of the community stakeholders looking at ways that we can come together and network, how we are allocating money towards the priorities that we develop together, and then sitting down and talking about it, talking through it, understanding that when you come into those conversations, it's it shouldn't be an all or nothing conversation, right? I either get everything I want or I don't want anything. When you come into the conversation like that, um, I, I hope that there are, you know, maybe there are some parents out there, I myself, my husband and that does not work, right? If our kids come to ever came to us with that type of all or nothing attitude, um, they would get a really swift answer and it would not be the answer uh, that they probably wanted. And so being able to come to the table with an open mind, willing to hear and understand and learn from each other, right? There's no kind of uh, one stakeholder that should hold more power than the other stakeholder if all things are equal and you're working together in the conversation to make sure that you're prioritizing things that you can agree on and you're allocating resources, sufficient resources to those things um, together based on priorities that you develop collaboratively. And so what are some of those ways that um, neighborhoods and local governments can partner on? Um, I need to hear from you. What are some of the ways that you can think of or maybe ways that you've already partnered with your local government? What are some of those ways? Anybody have any experience working with your local government on a project together, like you as an individual or maybe even your neighborhood organization? Any ideas? Ah, okay, Tina said Crime Stoppers or cops. Yes, there are lots of national nights out across the, uh, the country matching grants, yep. Uh, for resident-led neighborhood projects. Yes, absolutely. Neighborhood cleanups, um, communication, listening, helping to solve, all of these things are great. Oh yeah, um, neighborhood planning. Um, excellent. These are all really, really pertinent ways that you can work with your local government. So here's a, a, a list that, that I put together and everybody just keep... Uh, um, um, putting them in the chat. I'm going to go over the ones that are on the slide. So these are some pretty common ones um, and certainly things that are happening here in Fort Worth. So we work with neighborhoods uh, on sidewalks, making sure that um, our sidewalks are in good repair and prioritizing neighborhoods um, that were typically under-resourced uh, in the past and making sure that if their sidewalks are, are not great, uh, that we prioritize those when we have uh, additional funding and make sure that we help uh, communities fix those sidewalks. So again, everybody has an opportunity to thrive and have a, a great neighborhood, a safe neighborhood. We work with 
neighborhoods on street lights, making sure that the uh, there are lights on residential um, streets so that, you know, back in the day when uh, the sun went down, street lights would come on and we would keep playing, right? Because the street lights were on. And then some people would have to go home and eat dinner. Um, but street lights, an important activity that you can partner with your local government. You can certainly partner with them. And I see those kinds of uh, um, uh, comments in the chat about public safety, working with your lo local law enforcement, but also don't just limit it to law enforcement, also working with your fire department on healthcare issues, as well as your local judicial system, um, working with parks um, to make sure that you know, if you, you have some open land um, that's in your area, um, what does it take to turn that open land into a city park or taking an existing park that may um, not have gotten the love that it probably deserved um, over the years and making sure that we kind of spruce it up and make sure that we plant flowers and keep the grass cut and maybe add some playground equipment or something like that. Then also community centers, looking at policy around affordable housing. This is really a big one all across the United States now. And then also um, land use and zoning, um, schools and universities, economic development in your area, making sure that you know, your neighborhood has uh, walkability um, and uh, you can walk to a grocery store or walk to a healthcare facility um, in your neighborhood looking at section three workforce. So um, those that are trying to get on their feet in, in public housing, making sure that we're still utilizing their skills whenever the city has um, construction projects, uh, both horizontal, which means moving up and then, uh, or, or I'm sorry, horizontal, flat. Ah, sorry, it's already been a morning. See, I need to take another cup of coffee, a uh, sip of my coffee, but horizontal construction, um, which includes parks and then also vertical construction, those built environments where you're building a, a facility. And then healthcare and prevention, that's where I mentioned that you can uh, certainly partner with um, your fire department because typically all fire departments have um, a uh, healthcare component to them um, where uh, they have emergency uh, um emergency personnel on, on, on staff, uh, and then also environmental sustainability, um, checking to see if there are brownfields near your uh, communities and how can you uh, partner uh, to, um, uh, to make sure that uh, all of those things are taken into consideration and then transportation, water and utilities infrastructure, and then public art is also a way that you can partner with your local government. Um, and and that's, that's really a key one as well, because uh, sometimes um, public art uh, may overlook kind of your local talent that you have right there in your backyard, uh, burgeoning artists um, who would, you know, have grown up, uh, born and bred in those areas, and when there's an opportunity for a big major public art project, making sure that you're checking in in your own backyard to see, hey, who are the artists that are right here that could possibly work on these public art projects? Um, and you don't always necessarily have to go to Europe or, or <laughs> uh, anywhere outside the United States or even outside your state or even outside your city um, to find really great artists that would be honored uh, to provide public art uh, right there in your community. So now we have to talk about trust um, because anytime you talk about relationships, trust has to be um, at the foundation of it. And if there's no trust, you really don't have any uh, legitimate partnership that's going to last um, and uh, or produce meaningful results. So we're gonna talk about uh, you know, regular meetings, focus groups, and then survey participation as ways that um, communities and uh, or neighborhoods and local governments uh, can actually help establish trust. 
When you have proactive regular meetings um, and proactive focus groups and proactive survey participation, those go a long way to building trust rather than meeting with communities after the fact. After uh, you've already developed the plan and then you kind of roll it out and say, hey, don't you love it? This is what we thought you might like. And we're going to do this because we've already allocated the money for this. Those kinds of situations don't really lend themselves to uh, great uh, relationships and they certainly don't build trust. So making sure that people, um, all identity groups and all those community partners that we identified in earlier slides have an opportunity to, to really get, get together um, and develop that trust by having conversations, right? That's how you build any relationship. Um, if any of you are in a relationship, you know that you can't really build the relationship if you don't talk often, right? If you don't talk consistency, consistently. Um, there may be times when, you know, you had a really strong relationship with someone and there was a period of time where you didn't talk, but then when you get back together again, it's you pick up right where you left off. Those are great, but um, just as a rule of thumb, you want to make sure that you are continuing to have conversations um, with your local partners uh, on a regular basis, and that whenever there's a focus group or a survey, that you participate. Because if you don't participate, <clears throat> that's when um, decisions are made and, you know, things get built or uh, money is spent. And, and then, you know, you're kind of like, wait, what? How did that happen? And then inevitably they'll say, well, we had a focus group and, you know, like three people showed up or we sent out a survey and the response rate was really low. So we had to move on this and we just moved with the information that we had. So if you really want to build trust and you really want to have a strong partnership between neighborhoods, communities, and your local government, you got to show up and you got to show up consistently. And you got to make sure that everybody's voice is represented in those meetings, not just the loudest voice or the voice that has time on their hands but all the voices that are represented in the identity of your neighborhood should be present. And if they can't be present, then making sure that there is someone who represents their voice in the room, in those focus groups, submitting those surveys and at those regular meetings. Okay, so we identified kind of four steps to equity in your neighborhood or community. Um, and it starts with those ideas that we went over in the initial part of our conversation. Number one, acknowledging how history and individual identity shapes perspective and outcomes. Acknowledging how history and individual identity shapes perspectives and outcomes. You've got to acknowledge that first if you really want equity, a sustainable model for equity. You got to acknowledge that. So you can't just uh, sometimes, well, if you're a new brand new neighborhood and there is no history, then, you know, that could be a different story. But chances are, even if it's a brand new neighborhood, the land that that neighborhood sits on has a history. So doing your research and finding out what is the history, not just of this neighborhood development, but what is the history of the land? What used to be here? Who used to be here before? And understanding that that's the first step. Number two is including foundational definitions of race, ethnicity, culture, and principles of equity. Making sure that everybody understands what you mean when you say race, what you mean when you say ethnicity, what you mean when you say culture and how you are defining your principles of equity. Then number three is determining and operationalizing 
drivers for equity. And we'll get into that one in a little bit. And then number four is probably one, well, these are all important, but if you're not doing number four, the other three things really don't matter. If you are not incorporating accountability and measurement into your equity plans for neighborhoods, you're never going to know if you're improving. And I'm going to tell you that um, having a good story to tell is great, but that is not what we mean when we say measurement. Because you have one good story to tell after you implemented something does not accountability or measurement make, right? You need a good story to back up the data (laughs) that you collected, right? To confirm the data or deny the data that you collected. But a standalone story, an anecdotal story, um, is not measurement. That is not accountability. It it makes people feel good. (laughs) If it's a great story, it makes people feel good. Or if it's a bad story, it'll make people feel bad. But it doesn't really get to the accountability or measuring progress and what you ultimately want to see. And so, okay, so now we're going to talk about what are the drivers for centering equity in neighborhoods. So the first driver that I want to talk to you about um, is local data, policy, process, laws, and ordinances. These are critical uh, to driving equity and equity plans. Understanding what your local data looks like. How are you collecting it? Um, what kinds of things are being captured? Who is collecting it? Where is it being stored and saved? Is it secure or is it open to cyber attack or, or um, you know, can anybody just go in and change the numbers if they don't like what it says? Understanding your local data is critical. And then looking at your policies and processes and your laws and ordinances. All of these things play a critical part and kind of drive where your equity plan will go, where it has the ability to go, and where it doesn't have the ability to go. So depending on what your data looks like, how it's being collected, if it's even being collected, what the uh, current policies or processes are, and what laws you actually have on the books um, are driver one in determining how beneficial or how Uh, um, impactful your neighborhood equity plans can be. So you want to operationalize each one of these areas. You want to operationalize the data. And these are things that I just uh, kind of went over with you. Again, you want to take it back to looking at historical uh, data and looking at Okay, Um, what does this data say about how different populations are impacted or were impacted um, by a particular policy or process or law? Um, So you have to use that historical context. Remember, ask, uh, looking at awareness and then skills and then knowledge, which is the history, understanding history. So if your data is being collected where you're not collecting demographic information and you can't do that assessment to find out how different identity groups are being impacted, that's something that you might want to reconsider. Making sure that, okay, great, you're collecting data, but you need to start collecting demographic information with the data so that you can kind of really dig into it and find out, okay, hmm, Is this zoning policy benefiting specific groups? And is it negatively impacting other groups? Or is this process working for everybody? Or um, does this policy or this process uh, give advantage to able-bodied individual and uh, disabled individuals or persons with disabilities Uh, they really don't have uh, access to this. Um, And looking at laws and ordinances, again, taking it through that historical process. 
Okay, how has this impacted specific groups, those community stakeholder groups, those individual identity groups? How does this impact them? So history and impact, right? Taking all of these drivers through that process and really digging into it and finding out, um, is this the best thing for everyone in our community? The second driver is local resource allocation, right? This is a biggie. This is a biggie because you can have all of these grand plans, but if there's no money or resources or human capital behind it, um, it's probably not going to happen. <laughs> uh, so looking for uh, a way to make sure that um, you have uh, these local resources uh, and looking at operationalize, uh, operationalizing these drivers. So operationalizing financial capital, human capital, the people that it takes to get it done, and then the time that it takes to get it done. Being very clear on that. Some of these ideas that um, neighborhoods may want to see, these neighborhood plans, they may take years to actually um, achieve. So understanding and being realistic about the time frame that it's going to take, and again, uh, taking it back through um, uh, that list of uh, history, uh, looking at history, how does this, uh, how does this, how how has this historically worked out when we've allocated this amount of money and we've only put this number of people behind this project and we've given them this amount of time, how has that worked out for us? Has it been successful or not? So history and impact when you're talking about operationalizing drivers. The third driver is um, alliances relationships and numbers. This is really key because you could have uh, one person that has a great idea, but if they're standing alone and nobody else agrees with that uh, idea or they, you know, nobody wants to push that forward, uh, you don't have an alliance. You, you haven't built relationships across groups identity groups and community groups, and you won't have the numbers to make sure that it becomes a reality. So again, operationalizing those drivers and making sure that as you develop alliances, that you, you look for ways to engage different groups, that you shouldn't just be uh, kind of go it alone, stand on your own, we're going to push this through if nobody else agrees with us. You can do that, um, but it's very rare that those are successful. And even if they are successful, they're short-term. They're short-term wins. So again, this is something you got to determine in your own community. Would you rather have a short-term win or would you rather have a sustainable program that multiple groups and stakeholders across multiple identity groups are uh, behind you on. And that's where you build the strength in your relationships. And that's where you get your numbers to make sure that things advance uh, in your relationship with local government. All right. So now we're into the accountability and measurement, right? Uh, like I said, this is, this is uh, pretty key. So if you you don't uh, do anything else. You got to make sure that you build accountability and measurement systems in your relationship with uh, your local government and with your community or neighborhood uh, organizations. And so how do you do that? You've got to develop accountability you can see, right? It's it's not, we're, we're kind of moving away from this kind of pie in the store, st uh, pie in the sky, uh, let's just tell a good story and then that'll be enough. Nope, we got to have data behind it, right? So we need to know um, who are the decision makers or decision making bodies that would be accountable for making progress. 
And it's not always, let me just tell you, it's not always the person that has the title, right? They typically have to answer to somebody else or someone or another body uh, themselves. So don't always necessarily just focus on someone because they have a title, but look at, okay, how does, what is the organizational structure here? And who are the real decision makers um, that are at work? And who controls or influences those drivers that we talked about? Who controls the data? Who has access, access to it? Who influences policy and process, law, financial capital, human capital, timelines, alliances, relationships, and numbers, right? And when we talk about decision-making bodies, sometimes those are um, boards, commissions, uh, committees, whether they are ad hoc or standing. Um, you have to take those uh, bodies into consideration when you are de developing an accountability or measurement uh, for a specific goal. Um, so you got to think about what accountability levers you can incorporate into your partnerships. Like what is going to, you know, what's going to, what's, what does that lever look like? What can you use um, as part of the accountability? And what is the impact to the vulnerable identity groups? Um, again, we're not talking about intent. You can have great intent, like, oh, I meant for this to go well. Um, <clears throat> I didn't mean for the, uh, you know, wedding cake to fall off the table, but guess what? If it's on the floor, it's on the floor. Um, it doesn't matter if your heart was in the right place, it's the cake's still on the floor. So you got to look at impact, right? You got to look at what this is actually uh, talking about. Um, and so uh, to dive a little deeper into developing measure, uh, data measures you can count, um, <clears throat> you got to ask these key questions. Is it being tracked somewhere now? And if it's not, who can and how can they start tracking it? Second question is, are you collecting demographic information with the data? Are you collecting information on, collecting information on ethnicity? Are you collecting information on age? Are you collecting information on language? Um, all of these things are part of what we call demographic information, making sure that you're collecting that so you can understand individual identity group impact. Another question is, is the data governance and security in place? Do you understand, is there a system for collecting the data that's consistent? Or is it just at the whim of whoever wants to collect the data? And then if, if that's happening, it's not really going to be an apples to apples comparison from year to year, because it's gonna be a, you know, they will have used a completely different process to collect data. So you wanna make sure that your data governance and security of the data is in place. Another question is, is the data collection and analysis um, is there a, a collection and analysis point, which means um, is there one point of contact or is the data just uh, kind of out there um, where anybody has the opportunity um, to manipulate the data or change the data um, if they want to. So you need to make sure this is kind of feeds into the security there um, that the data you're collecting has one access point. Um, or a responsible access point. Another question, is the data and analysis transparent and easily accessible to everyone? So if it's accessible on a website, how many clicks in does it take to get to the data? Or is there a dashboard that anybody can just go to one landing page and find it? And are the metrics measuring the right things? This is really, really important. Uh, you got to make sure that you're not just kind of picking metrics or measurements um, because you you Googled it and you found one, um, but it really doesn't pertain to what you ultimately want to see, but it sounds really good. Um, you got to make sure that you are measuring the right things. So sometimes it's good to work backwards. Find out and determine what you want and then work backwards. Okay, what information can we collect that will tell us 
how this is improving. And then um, the last two, is there a robust form of impact analysis by vulnerable identity groups? Are you measuring impact on parts of your community that don't have uh, a regular um, and equal voice at decision-making tables? And then last but not least, are the timelines realistic? You know, when you come up with a plan, you, you know, everybody is like all into these, into SMART goals, and those are great, but you don't want to create an unrealistic time frame and have people in your community thinking that you're going to have world peace in two years, right? You need to make sure that you are um, looking at short-term goals, that low-hanging fruit that you can get done really quickly, and then looking at long-term plans. Like, what's going to take a generation to figure out if this was really worth all of the uh, the effort that we put in. And so you want to make sure that you are incentivizing consistent engagement. Um, you want to avoid uh, the chicken little uh, syndrome, um, where you know everything is is um, uh, uh, the chicken little syndrome where, you know, nobody wants to participate when all the work has to get done. Um, but then uh, everybody wants to jump on when things go bad uh, or there's a major failure. Again, you got to pay attention to who and how the work leading to those outcomes is getting done, making sure that they have um, the resources and the people, people and money um, to actually get it done. Uh, and you need to incentivize making sure that you get that participation, whether it's in a, uh, in a survey or um, <clears throat> in a survey or uh, in a focus group or in regular meetings. And then think critically, right? Nothing is cut and dry, right? There's always a gray area and most things that uh, we talk about, uh, nothing is, is generally going to be all good or all bad. There's usually a backstory there. And so it becomes our responsibility when we're trying to, to match uh, communities and local governments together to get to that history, the reason, um, the focus, uh, and focus on tested, verified facts and truth. Right, things that can be verified by multiple uh, resources or sources. Um, I, I cannot stress enough how important that is. Uh, in the age of social media, where anybody can kind of tell their own story, um, that is amazing, that's great, that's an advancement. But your story needs to be valid and it needs to be uh, backed up with facts and truth. And so you need to start looking at first source narratives and accurate data to tell the complete story, right? You, you shouldn't just have a bunch of uh, stories with no data, and you shouldn't just have a bunch of data with no stories. You need both of them to come to the table with local government to make sure that that is guiding the work that you're doing together. All right, that is what I've got for you. Um, now I wanna open it up for questions. Uh, I was trying to catch some of them, but there are some that were really long, so I couldn't really read all of them and uh, present. So are there any questions out there uh, for me or any questions on the information that we went over? So, Christina, um, Nicole Pruitt did put a question in the question answer part. She said she's asking these definitions are awesome. She's referring to the beginning when we were talking about all the different definitions. Do you also have a definition for justice or do you think justice is related to the impact or intent of power? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We did. We didn't talk about it in this presentation. Because when you talk about uh, justice, that is uh, that deserves its own presentation by itself. 
Um, it is the incorporation of all of the concepts that we talked about today in the context of law. And so um, it is, it's definitely applicable um, here, but we only, I only had, <laughs> I only had a short amount of time and I, I could not fit all of the aspects um, in that space in here, but you're absolutely right. Justice is definitely uh, a part of the conversation when you talk about um, neighborhood equity and working with uh, your local government. Yes, for sure. I know. I wish we had all day, right? <laughs> all week, really. We could talk about all of this for, for days. Yeah, um, this, could, this could be like a semester long class. <laughs> of course, I know. So um, Mark has a question as well. And if you guys don't know Mark Hellman, he used to be work for the city of Fort Worth, but now he lives in Bellevue in Washington. And he's asking, what are some encouraging signs that you see in Fort Worth? What is working? encouraging signs um, that people are still engaged. Mm -hmm. um, one of the greatest things about uh, the work that I've um, been doing here, and I've only been here just a little over a year. So I'm originally from Texas, but San Antonio, we moved away and, and we're in Indiana for about uh, 16, 17 years and then came back to Texas. And the work uh, in the space of diversity, equity, inclusion, had already started with the Race and Culture Task Force. Mm -hmm. um, 22 residents from Fort Worth got together. They came up with 22 recommendations across seven different areas. And people are constantly, our department is responsible for tracking the progress uh, of those 22 recommendations. People are constantly checking in um, and saying, okay, what happened? What's going on in those seven key areas of criminal justice, uh, education, economic development, governance, health, housing, transportation. They want to see progress. And so that's really key to making sure that this stays top of mind um, in, in, uh, on the government side um, and in the community. So people being engaged and uh, the uh, review of those recommendations and strategies and progress that's underway right now with our Human Relations Commission, uh, a group of 11, again, uh, Fort Worth residents that are reviewing that because that originally that plan was a five-year plan. It's due, uh, the deadline is uh, in 2023. So they're looking at it right now. Okay, do these metrics make sense? Is this timeline realistic? Are there resources uh, sufficient resources being allocated to achieve these strategies that we set out. And the strategies that have been achieved, okay, can they be replaced with something new? So this ongoing dynamic process that's taking place is encouraging uh, because it lets me know that people didn't just uh, have these conversations beginning in 2017 as a one-off in reaction or response to something uh, tragic that happened uh, in our community. It started the conversation, but they haven't stopped. And the work that's being done behind the scenes is also really encouraging. We still have a lot of work to do. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, this is going to be a, uh, it's going to be a yeoman's job to make sure that it all takes place, but people aren't forgetting about it. No. And they, they are um, constantly asking and pushing and probing. And that's always a great thing. Yes, for sure. I, I see that in anything that we do with our neighborhoods and just as a resident of Fort Worth and being around Fort Worthians, it's definitely a top of mind and continue conversation, um, which, you know, that engagement is there. So we have time for one more question. Um, it's from Rebecca. She says, how do you reconcile the economic e equity lens in a community? That's a mouthful. <laughs> yeah. So let me make sure I understand the question. How do you reconcile, uh, what was the last part? The economic equity lens in a community. Ah, so economic development. So uh, again, this is an area that I could have just done a whole presentation on economic development in neighborhoods. Uh, the, one of the best examples that we have going on right now in Fort Worth is the stop six uh, area. Um, it is a neighborhood uh, revitalization area 
stop sticks, if you know anything about Fort Worth, is uh, historically um, one of the oldest African-American neighborhoods that was um, under-resourced for many years. And so you saw a lot of decline and decay in infrastructure, um, uh, businesses, um, just, you know, no grocery stores, all that. And, and in the past uh, uh, several years, um, well, last year, the city won a 30, over $30 million grant in partnership with Fort Worth Housing Solutions to um, kind of be a, a, a starting point for economic revitalization in an under-resourced neighborhood, historically under-resourced neighborhood. So it starts with mixed use development in affordable housing and retail, grocery stores, uh, and um, we're working uh, side by side with um, the school district um, to see ways that we can improve the school system because a lot of times that has a major impact on attracting um, economic development to a specific neighborhood. So there are lots of ways that um, you can work with uh, your local government to make sure that you turn the page and shift the conversation and actually see progress when it comes to economic uh, stabil stability or stabilizing um, a historically under-resourced uh, area and making it, uh, you know, become an engine, an economic engine uh, for the community, bringing in uh, grocery stores, bringing in retail, bringing in uh, job centers uh, that are within walking distance to affordable homes. All of those things can happen, but again, it requires a partnership um, and multiple departments in the city. It's not, I know economic development usually has the title, but it's, it takes economic development. It takes uh, whichever department in your city covers land use and zoning. It takes transportation and public works when they talk about street and infrastructure and water, uh, replacing old pipes. Um, all of those things, all of those departments have to come to the table with communities to kind of plan what needs to happen and how you want it to happen and how quickly you want it to happen while being able to maintain the culture that exists in your neighborhood today, that you shouldn't have to change or assimilate into being something that you don't want to be necessarily uh, in order for money to flow into your community. Thank you so much for that. So I wish we had time for more questions, but we don't. There are a couple more questions um, there and we'll make sure that Christina gets those and hopefully maybe she can reach out um, and connect with you guys to answer those for you. Um, please uh, remember that this session was being recorded. I did see something in the comments that said, somebody wants to go back and watch it again because they, <laughs> they wanna get more out of it. So thank you so much, Christina, for your time, um, for supporting our, our team and being here for NUSA. We really, really appreciate it. Um, we've got, um, you've got a few minutes, guys, to go to the restroom, grab a drink, grab a snack, um, and head to your next workshop. Um, thank you so much for being here, everyone. I learned a lot. I have like two pages of notes over here and I'm definitely going to be connecting with Christina for some books or materials for to dig into to learn even more. So thank you so much. We greatly appreciate you. You're so welcome. Everybody have a great afternoon and enjoy NUSA. Yes. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye everyone.